From 2010 to 2012, graziers celebrated a run of wet years around the outback. For the first time in many people's memory, the Cooper was flowing from its headwaters, its entire 1,500 kilometre length, to Lake Eyre. Across the watershed between the Lake Eyre Basin and the Gulf Rivers, few suspected they would be fighting to save their country from the prickle tree explosion that was to follow. Cespony is on the headwater of a Georgian a diamond tanner, so it's a huge seas base that is spreading. We are doing buffer zones around boundaries and we are spending quite a bit of money on it, but it, it's a problem that's a bit too big for us. This dead stuff outside that we've sprayed around the trough here, it, it just grew from ground, a grass level to that in those couple of years. Looking across this flat up here, you could see from one side to the other, and now you, you, know, you can't even see 100 metres. Prickly acacia had been around for 100 years before in the 1920s that the state government recommended it be planted for shade tree in western and northwest Queensland to help the lambing seasons among sheep. The first explosion of prickly acacia would have been in the 1950 wet years. It wasn't really that bad because predominantly the country was still under sheep. But by the time the 74 wets came around, sheep had gone out and all that northern country had gone under cattle. And then we saw a doubling of the area under prickly acacia. After the last big wet, graziers contemplated the cost of prickly acacia to their livelihoods. Some of that Downs country now is only helicopter musterable. Uh, it obviously, nobody wants to buy it. Until you've had it, people don't realise what, how bad it gets and how it can take over. Eventually if we have to sell this place, I don't want to sell a, a worthless bloody forest, you know. It chokes out more grass than any feed value it produces. It can turn mustering into a nightmare, with its long thorns being a danger to people, stock and vehicles, and inevitably some stock escape muster. Desert Channels Queensland had been working with landholders to control weeds for more than a decade in the Lake Eyre Basin. Peter Spence oversees their weed program. When I think about all the grant money we gave out over the DCQ's first 10 years, some people achieved a lot, but most people didn't achieve anything because no sooner had they cleaned the paddock up, the cattle then brought it back off the waterways. In a bid to gain the upper hand, DCQ began testing new control methods and rallying landholders to tackle the weed. Cespania was one of the biggest field days that Desert Channels has ever had, and part of that reason was because we had some new technology. But out of that field day, the landholders told us, it was all very interesting, but we need some ideas to control the riparian or the creek areas, because they're areas that we can't get into and, and are very costly and time consuming. And unless we clean up those areas, it's a waste of time cleaning the rest of the paddock because we're just going around in a circle. We basically have the Diamantina River system, the Cooper Creek, and the rest in between are depression lines or gullies. There's no permanent water holes in them. And they are the areas that normally grow a lot of prickly acacia trees. And it dawned on desert channels that we had to eradicate it out of the core areas to make it viable then for the landholders to clean the rest of the properties up. With the desperate situation of graziers on infested properties, DCQ set out to achieve what many believed impossible, the eradication of prickly acacia from the catchments of the Lake Eyre Basin. Eradication hadn't been considered because, well, no one had thought about it. It was too hard. Let's just pack it back to the waterways. We'll contain it there. So to achieve what the landholders wanted, we had to go away and have a good think about it because one, we had to improve the cost of killing trees in a depression line. We had to be able to do that without killing mature native trees. Also, we had to get landholders involved 
and asked them to put some skin into the project to help towards the cost of it. And we had to get groups of neighbours to work together up a depression line or a system to make it effective and lasting. And not only on top of all that, we had to work out a better way of finding where the prickly acacia was the thickest and, and expanding the quickest, plus we had to work out a cost to the project so that we knew, landholders knew and the state government knew what it was going to cost to do these projects. You know, we did a lot of miles and a lot of phone calls in the first two or three months to get this up and running. To have the best chance at eradication, they needed to rapidly take stock of the prickly infestations across their vast region. Jade Fraser began discussions with Queensland government scientists. It was quite encouraging uh, what they produce through satellite imagery that we can look at and say, OK, where are the spread of weeds? We were so excited because, you know, at a certain property, we knew that, hey, this is actually close to perfect. It's a time series mapping, so we can go back 10 years or, or 15 years, and since those couple of wet years, we can really pick up the increase. Satellite maps are just the start. Each property needs a detailed map showing how dense each part of the infestation is and a plan to divide the work between the landholder and DCQ. Although the maps take a while to produce, the beauty of the maps is we know what tool we're going to use out of a toolbox, whether it's chemical, wet, dry, the drone. So we know what's going on before we get there and the landholder knows his costs. They also had to pioneer faster, cheaper and more effective methods of killing prickle trees. Now when we first started, we had a lot of trials. We had to work out what chemical, different country types or different density of trees. Ayrshire Hills was a strategic trial site. The prickly acacia started on these hills and as you look down your waterways, you know, out to the west here, you see it going for miles and if we don't stop it, it's going to end up into the Diamantina and that's the main reason we started here because this is a huge seed source. A year later, the trials were paying off. We had to work out, you know, where do we use the drone, where do we use the boys on ATVs and do we use tempothorin, do we use wet chemical or do we use a mister? It was a very interesting couple of months. Two of the biggest for making a quick and saving is, is one a drone, we can do a hectare in eight minutes. 800 to 1,000 stems or better thick. So that's, you know, that's the stage where it's getting hard to walk through. We can do that in eight minutes with the drone. And the other big improvement is, is using tebrothorin in pellets. It's just so quick, four times quicker than, than the traditional basal barking. The benefit of using tebrothorin is you're buying yourself three or four years control because it stays in the ground. Peter recognises that regardless of DCQ's innovations and drive, relationships are central to the success of their plan. The big thing about doing something new is you've got to build your trust, you've got to get relationships going. And we've worked on this, we've worked on with the landholders, local government, state and federal government. We enjoy having the representatives from either state or federal to come out because it's hard for them to see what we're doing. It's hard for them to visualise what we've done unless they come out and see it on ground. Once they get out here, we've had some good reactions. They can see what we're actually trying to do. And by doing this, we've achieved two special permits. The trust and understanding allowed DCQ to negotiate an area management plan and chemical use permit, without which there was little hope of eradicating the dense core infestations. DCQ developed the AMP with feedback from the landholders to remove some of the costs associated with weed control whilst ensuring that mature native trees remain. If he comes and does the plan with us and gets his AMP, it gives him the opportunity to kill those trees that previously, because of where they were, we weren't allowed to take our chemicals there. Clearly along your water depression lines, you want to save your natives and using different techniques that we have, we've achieved that as you can see behind me. And that also is a part of the AMP that we can protect our native trees, but we've achieved our goal of killing all the prickly acacia trees. 
The scale of the issue and its impact on graziers has drawn the attention of state and federal politicians. It's the responsibility of government, and me being a part of government, is to expose to my leaders the brilliant outcomes that have been reached here and the passion that not only the Desert Channels Queensland people have got, but also the landholders themselves. We've had our sceptics, but we had 131 people attend three meetings through the north at the start of the year. At one of the meetings we were at, <coughs> two older gentlemen were holding the floor at this meeting and they were convincing us that we couldn't do anything about prickly acacia, we can never eradicate it, and we, we need to learn to live with it. And we're at the stage of thought, well, these people want to live with prickly acacia, well, no use coming here. And then there was a young fella up the back piped up and said, I don't believe you. I don't believe in what you're saying. I'm coming home to take over Dad's place and I want to do something about me prickly acacia. So when the motion was put up, there was 32 people at that meeting and 30 of them voted in favour of what the work we were doing. And that's, you know, the change is there, it's coming. It's been a long time coming, but the attitude towards prickly acacia is changing. It's been a big learning curve for us, but, and it still will be, because we need to keep thinking outside the square. And I think the biggest achievement for, for me and probably the, the field crew was when we reached our first million treated trees. I mean, that was huge. I mean, I'm a, I'm a landholder that come out of the 90 drought without all the land I started with. And one of my regrets was one place out of four had prickly acacia and I didn't quite leave it in a better state than it was when I went there. So it was a big achievement personally to me to, to do that and it was a big achievement to me field crew. Because when you see, see an area come under control, it makes you want to go on and get more. You see that with your neighbours. From where we started on the Wokingham to the top of the Wokingham River system, we had 100% landholder involvement. And then the other thing that really pleases me that we've had shires outside our rapid area that we we're involved in here, north of us, looking over the fence and coming to talk to us and saying, we're impressed with what you're doing. Can you come and talk to us and, and we'll see if we can get going on the same principle. And I was pretty excited about the first million and that took us 12 months. We've done another million it only took us eight months. Here we're on the Wokingham system here at the moment. We've done, at this point, about 90 kilometres of it. We'll pill everything that we can pill with Tipithoron. All the native trees you can see around the background, we'll spray in a 50 metre circle around them to protect them. The toughest thing about this job is probably the heat and the fly sometimes. I'm born and bred Western boys, so even some days the flies annoy me, but um, heat's a big thing, 13 days over 45, in the middle of the day, you know, you're racked up, masks, so forth. Before you know it, you look back over your shoulder and think, oh, gee, we covered a lot of country today. And you know, now the, it, it's dry and, and a lot of these people into the third year, probably next year we're looking at a fourth year, it just becomes too big a task because you've got to find the money. We've got methods to kill that's reduced the cost and there's a whole change in what landholders think out there and they want help and they want to come on board except the future for funding is not very good and that's a serious problem because I personally believe that with enough funding and enough cooperation between state, federal and local government, our plan is achievable and prickly acacia can be eradicated from the core areas in the DCQ area. For Desert Channels to come and do this has given us a real, well, a brighter future, I think, as far as controlling it. We definitely need help. We don't want people doing it all for us, that's for sure. We've got to do most of it, but we need help because we're not going to get on top of it. People aren't viable uh, at the moment in lots of areas because of drought. My father always taught me that when you leave 
the land to the next generation. It should be in better order than what it was given to you, and that's what I believe in. And I think this prickly acacia is going to, if we don't get on top of it, it's going to destroy the best free-range country we have.